Okay, thank you for the introduction. And I'd also like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity uh, to talk about some of the work we've been doing with Miri, especially at High Redshift. Uh, now, what it feels like, uh, been waiting a very long time, but I guess it's only really been a year since we got uh, this very deep data with Miri. So, in particular, I'm going to focus on the work of the Miri uh, European Consortium um, and targeting these very early galaxies. And I will also say some of the work that I'm going to talk about is in prep and not published. So where it says in the slides, please don't take pictures, please don't take pictures. Um, so the collaborators and people that this work kind of belongs to uh, with all the members of the, the GTO team listed there, which uh, Gillian is also part of, and so I guess she's not here right now, and uh, Karina Capuzzi, who will also give a talk uh, later on in the week. Um, so I guess I don't need to do too much of an introduction, um, as we've already seen from earlier talks from Sandra and others, and uh, Takahiro as well, This. This is kind of the schematic we have for the history of the universe, where on the right-hand side, you have the present day, where you have these nice, beautiful Hubble-like, Hubble sequence, grand design spiral galaxies. And as you go back in time, things become more chaotic, more turbulent. Um, but we really didn't have a clear picture of, of this up to the dark ages um, and the highest redshift pre-JVST. So with, with Hubble, you could push up to, you know, just over one, 1 billion years ago, maybe up to redshift 10, but uh, the highest redshift galaxy we had at that point was, was sensitive detections um, around, around redshift 10. And then it's really only with JWST that, as we've seen from the other talk, you can both push much higher redshift due to the sensitivity, but more importantly, it's the wavelength coverage allowing you to probe this rest frame optical, uh, rest frame UV now at much higher redshift. So these are the four instruments that we've all come to love over the last uh, year and a half. Um, but in particular, it is it, this instrument, MIRI, which is the mid-infrared instrument um, that gives you this mid-infrared wavelength coverage. So near CAM, you can sample up from one micron rest frame to uh, four, four and a half, whereas with MIRI, its filters go from 5.6 all the way up to uh, 25th micron. So this really uh, gives you a new window, new insights to the high redshift. So if you want to study and discover the first galaxies in the universe, one of the best things you can do is to just take a deep field observation. Um, so as part of the MIRI uh, European GTO team, this is what we did. Uh, and we picked the Hubble Ultra Deep Field because then on top of your deep JWST MIRI imaging, you also nicely get your already taken uh, Hubble deep image. So in total, the, the GTO program has 125 hours of imaging and spectroscopy. Uh, this is split between 60 hours focused on the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, which we've coined the MIRI uh, Mid Infrared Deep Imaging Survey. And then the other 65 hours is on spectroscopy, which I'll come on to later, which is targeting specific previously known high redshift objects where you can take mid infrared spectroscopy for the first time. Um, and as well as this, we also get coordinated parallels and simultaneous observations uh, with the MIRI and, and NIRCAM and, and NIRIS. So, this is what the, the MIDIS, the, the MIRI Deep Imaging Survey looks like. The white contour you can see on the right is the MIRI footprint, and this perfectly overlaps with the deep AMUSE observations that are in this field, the Hubble imaging, which is shown in the background, and then the blue contours is also the ALMA uh, from the ASPEC survey. And also handily, this is the region of sky that uh, Jade's observed with NIRCAM, so we both have deep Hubble imaging and very, very deep, almost the deepest um, NIRCAM image. So we also get NIRCAM parallels uh, in another part of the field uh, <laughs> where we have deep um, HSD ACS uh, imaging, and then there's also NIRES parallels. But in this, this talk, I'm just going to focus on the work we've been doing with MIRI. Um, and Karina will focus on uh, the rest of the work we've been doing, because obviously with a deep field, you don't only get the highest redshift things. Most of your objects are distributed at lower redshift. So this is what the observations look like on the sky. Um, and if we just focus on the MIRI pointing, this is what our MIRI deep field in the five point. And you can really see the increase in resolution and sensitivity when you compare this to what you had with SPITZER before. So where you had these kind of big blobs in the SPITZER 5.8 micron image, you now have these beautifully well-resolved uh, objects in with JVST, which fit into multiple components. And we can really then study these objects in much greater. Um, and in particular, one of the first things we thought when we got these MIRI observations is, are there any MIRI only, so near cam dark or HST dark as well, detected objects? That would be incredibly interesting because as we've heard uh, earlier this afternoon, using these dropout techniques, if it's only detected in the MIRI bands, 
and you were to believe these were kind of Lyman breaks, Baumol breaks, these would put these objects at extremely high redshift. And given in the first year of JWST, we know we've now been discovering things at 12, redshift 13, or redshift 14, as we heard earlier. Maybe this is something that we can detect. Um, so you can go through and you can characterize objects that you might think are MIRI only. So the no detection when you stack all the HST and NIRCAM data, uh, and this is ongoing work. And you can also, with the deep ALMA data, you can stack. But some of the things you have to take into account is this might not just be a high redshift galaxy. It could be a very dusty galaxy, as we heard before, um, where all of the rest frame UV optical light is just completely attenuated, and then you're only seeing the 5.6. Could be a very low mass, extreme line emitting galaxy where it's not detected in all of your other bands, but the strong emission lines means it's detected in, in this case, in the 5.6. Uh, it could also be brown dwarfs. Um, it might be a very high redshift galaxy, but really we need spectroscopy to confirm that. Or in the worst case, it could just be a spurious cosmic ray hot pixel that, although you remove these in your reduction, uh, might have got through with the number of observations we have and the length of observations you can get cosmic ray effects. So this takes, uh, a lot of time to go through and carefully visually analyze, analyze all of these frames uh, and check and exclude spurious sources. But not in the 5.6, but in the 10 micron, uh, one of the sources we recently identified, uh, which has been submitted uh, in the last week, is uh, an object that is not detected in any of the stacked Jade's near cam bands, uh, not detected also in our very deep 5.6 micron imaging, but is detected in the 10 micron image. Um, and if you fit the photometry, including the stacked photometry, you kind of come up with four plausible solutions. So if you go through all of your favorite spectral energy distribution codes and you, you use the same photometry for all, you they all come back with four solutions that are kind of probable in terms of the, the probability distribution of your redshift, but then of the physical parameters you get back, you then have to decide what is. So this is an object we are actually submitting a DDP for um, to hopefully confirm what it is because it could, it fits quite well to be a round dwarf, so a galactic solution with a temperature of 300 Kelvin. It could also be a, a low mass um, galaxy at redshift 0.4 that has very strong PA features. It also fits quite nicely to be a dusty galaxy or intermediate redshift, um, or it could be a, a redshift uh, 15 galaxy that has a very similar spectrum to what we've known in the last year, a little red dot. But with just photometry, this is not really something you can say it is definitely one of them. But it's in, even so, it's a very interesting object that before these observations, we, we didn't know this class of objects. Um, so as well as discovering new objects, we can also look at things that were detected with uh, with the Jade survey and the NIRCAM data. So one of the highest redshift objects that was there was this uh, redshift 11.58 Jade um, object as reported in the Robinson paper. And this object is clearly detected in our 5.6 micron detail. So because we are probing uh, slightly longer wavelength, we then have more constraints on the uh, on the stellar mass, star formation rate, because your stellar continuum is slightly more constrained. Um, and then this gives you very nice insights into the, the formation of these very early galaxies, and we can constrain the morphology also of this object at 5.6. Although it should be noted, although it seems slightly extended in the MIRI band, the MIRI PSF is a bit larger than that in NIRCAM, so it's not just a straightforward eye-to-eye -eye constraint. Um, there's also GNZ11, which we've also heard about this afternoon, um, where we have in our simultaneous observations, we also have 5.6, 7.7 imaging of these, these objects. And just from initial analysis, um, comparing the color you get in the 5.6, 7.7, and also in the four micron band, this object is very red. Um, and therefore, with, the, with this new um, imaging in MIRI, sampling this, this uh, rest frame and further into the, the stellar continuum, then we can really start to constrain the stellar population to this object. And also in, in March, later this year, we're gonna get MIRI spectroscopy for this object. So again, that will push from five micron up to um, So that would be incredibly interesting because then we can determine the exact nature of this object, whether it's an extreme line emitter or whether this AGN nature, which has been reported by other studies. So that's upcoming. Yes. So then the other side of the MIRI program that we have is the MIRI uh, MRS at high redshift. And for this side, the observations were targeted on specific objects, um, some of which we've heard about already. Um, in particular, uh, was this MAX 11 uh, JD1 that we heard about before, which I'll come on to later, um, as well as for the first time we targeted a, a quasar at redshift 7. 
So we were for the first time able to take a rest frame near infrared spectrum of a quasar uh, during the epoch of realization. Um, and that, this is what the spectrum looks like. And um, you can clearly see these really nice um, emission lines with the H alpha line and this upturn uh, at rest frame 1.4 micron, showing you the indication that there's uh, warm dust in the torus of this, uh, this quasar. So this is really nice observations that we got. Um, you can measure the, the mass of the black hole in this system from the different emission lines. And comparing to previous studies, which were done in rest frame UV with the magnesium two line, you can begin to build a picture where there's not much dust attenuation that's going on in the system that actually about means that your mass estimates from these different line traces are consistent. Um, and when you compare the properties of this quasar at redshift seven to those at lower redshift, you actually find that it's very consistent. So it's quite a very evolved system, um, already formed 800 million years after the Big Bang. So then you kind of brings into question, how do you form such a huge mature system at such an early epoch in the universe? Um, and therefore you have to adopt models where you know it's growing at Eddington rate or even super Eddington rate in some cases. And this is you know, like, um, something that we're still looking into, but this paper was, will come out in nature hopefully soon, but is, uh, is already on. Um, then, we have these objects uh, that uh, Takahiro mentioned where you have max 11 uh, JD1, the redshift 9.11 and slightly lensed objects, but you could detect it with HSD at 1.6 uh, micron, but now with MIRI imaging, again, we did a nice detection at 5.6, but we can for the first time spatially resolve the H-alpha line. In the and you can see that the H-alpha agrees nicely with the, the O3 that was previously detected, um, but you get these two distinct clumps uh, in the, in the H-alpha map and they have very different um, kinematics between the north and the south. So if you look at the spectrum between these two, you find that the velocity dispersions between these two clumps are very different, uh, potentially indicating the presence of outflows and turbulence in, in one of these clumps. So for future studies of this object, it's very important that maybe we look, go more down the lines of spatially resolved analysis rather than doing integrated quantities, because you can clearly see that there are distinct clumps with different uh, evolutions and properties. So I think uh, with that, I will leave it there. Um, but th well, my concluding remarks is that MIRI now is this only instrument available that can probe this rest frame uh, near infrared spectral range in the high redshift. And there is no other instrument for the next 20 odd years that is going to be able to do this. So now is kind of the time, and especially with proposals coming out tomorrow, that will be exciting to see what new data and what new things MIRI is gonna discover that you know, goes beyond what NIRCAM has already done.